Great, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, after sort of sitting in on some of the stuff this morning, I, I do feel like saying that, and now for something completely different, because I think this is going to um, feel very different from um, kind of what you, uh, most of what you've been doing, I think. Um, so I, I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of. Uh, what what I do, kind of how I got into it, what the this field that um, has kind of be called neuroethics is, um, and uh, say a little bit about that, and then uh, and then I think bring it to the kind some of the an intersection with the kinds of things that um, that you're working on, and then I thought what we do uh, toward the latter half is. Um, is kind of work through some cases together, uh, maybe break break into some some groups and kind of work uh, on those in groups, and then kind of come together uh, as as a larger group. Um, so I'll we'll start by saying I don't have any disclosures. This is something usually more important for for medical type lectures. Um, so uh, so up here I work in this. Uh, Neural Engineering Center called the the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering, and it's a NSF funded center. It's been around um, almost 10 years now, um, and it's it's focused on implantable uh, uh, brain electrodes um, for kind of a variety of of conditions: um, spinal cord injury, stroke. Um, and other things. Um, when it was when it was founded, and the the um, the PIs were sort of putting together the proposal, um, I think there was this realization, both on their part and uh, at the NSF, that uh, this kind of research uh, was bound to raise some ethical issues, and they wanted to build in from the ground floor. Um, uh, some um, some infrastructure to start thinking about those in tandem with developing the devices, and so um, they weren't sure kind of what that would uh, entail, um, but they did sort of recognize that from uh, from early on, and so um, so over the the life of the center, there's there's a group uh, that I'm a part of that that does. Um, both kind of conceptual work, um, kind of talking through different uh, uh, ethical issues sort of at a conceptual level that are raised by uh, um, this sort of technology, and then doing kind of more empirical work. So kind of going out and, uh, and talking to people who um, are in the, uh, that we enroll in the studies about, how the, uh, about why they want to enroll, um, what their experience is in the trials, um, as well as uh, talking to people who um, might benefit from the from the devices. So I think one of the worries, um, kind of when we started, was that um, that the people developing the devices would think that they know what are the most important things that the that the individuals um, would want, to, uh, and uh, without asking them, um, uh, sometimes we're mistaken. So, so for instance, um, there's um, a relatively uh, famous study um, of um, sort of interviewing people with um, uh, 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 cervical injuries um, who are in wheelchairs, and then they asked uh, um, engineers uh, what uh, what they think the, their priority would be. You know, if they could have anything, what would it be? And it uh, and the engineers said, well, to be able to walk again, we think people would want to be able to walk again, and that's that's the kinds of things that we should work on. Um, but when you talk to the the individuals, their um, their higher priorities was were um, uh, bowel and bladder function, um, um, and even sexual function was uh, was more important than. Um, uh, than being able to walk again. So, you know, unless you kind of go out and ask people, um, it's uh, it's hard to know what people's um, priorities are. So, uh, you know, when uh, when our center started, it's about the same time that uh, a number of the the, the uh, kind of brain projects from around the world got started. So, um, you know, the Obama's Brain Initiative starts in 2014. Um, funded with, I think the first year was about uh, 50 million dollars. Um, last year, I think they got 260. So just kind of a uh, a big ramp up, and this is matched by the the European Human Brain Project, and and China has a a big project now, and so um, 
So clearly a lot of societal resources are going into to funding neuroscience. Um, when, uh, when the Obama administration set up the, the Brain Initiative, they laid out a number of principles um, for kind of what it should do and what the, what the aims were. And so one of them was um, consider the ethical implications of, of this research. So things like um, neural enhancement and, and data privacy um, and how neuroscience, advances in neuroscience might be used in the law or education or um, or in the commercial space. And this sort, of, um, sort of fits in with this, sort of the emergence of this field called neuroethics, which, which sort of shows up in the early 2000s. Um, and, uh, and it tends to be initially organized around kind of two different issues. One is um, the um, ethics of neuroscience. So you know, how, do you, how do you conduct neuroscience research in an ethical fashion? Um, and what kinds of problems should you be working on? What kinds of problems shouldn't you be working on? How, how, and how to work on those problems, right? Um, and then the, the other is the, the neuroscience of ethics, which um, is essentially how do you, you know, if we think about how people make ethical decisions, what can neuroscience tell us about that? Um, and so kind of um, at the same time that uh, fMRI is, is sort of coming, coming on the scene, um, there's a there's a study which some of you may know of uh, by by Josh Green who um, gives people the uh, the trolley problem while they're in the the scanner and um, had two variations on that so this trolley trolley problem um, you may know is is uh, is this uh, dilemma used in uh, thought experiment in, in philosophy where you know there's this runaway trolley you're this person in the middle you have the opportunity to to uh, shift the track it's gonna if you do nothing it's gonna uh, barrel down and kill five people and you have the opportunity at the last second to, to shift it to just kill one person right so this is a um, a, a test of what kind of ethical thinking um, uh, um, what kind of ethical thinking, whether it's sort of utilitarian thinking or whether or not um, something uh, more akin to um, what's called deontology or Kantian thinking about um, which of those ought to help decide these sorts of dilemmas. And so his group um, sort of put people in, in the scanner with this, with this uh, dilemma and then a variant of, of that where um, you have the uh, opportunity not to, to pull a switch, but actually to push someone over the edge of a, uh, of a drawbridge and onto the track. And, um, and his, his theory was that those are two very different problems. One is very um, uh, sort of personal moral and the other is, is sort of um, an impersonal moral and that we use different we activate different parts of our brain and different uh, thought processes. And so this, this got a lot of interest. Um, and you may know some of this or may know, may know more of it than I do. Um, um, but that, that's kind of how things kind of got started. Um, but of course, there was uh, lots of, um, uh, there were lots of ethical issues in neuroscience and, neuro and neurology and psychiatry uh, before the early 2000s. Um, um, even though the sort of field seemed to get started uh, about then. Um, if you go back to the President's Commission, so every president since Carter has created a, an ethics commission to examine um, ethical issues in, in, uh, in emerging technology and um, new therapies in medicine, thinking that, you know, uh, with these developments uh, come new problems that we need to sort of um, think through. The current administration, I think, is probably the only one that has um, not created one of these. Um, but even if you kind of go back, um, you know, to the, to the 70s, um, you know, you, you have concern with um, psychiatric and neurologic issues in ethics. So, you know, should we enroll um, the mentally ill in research or not? Or are, they, um, or are they a protected population, right? So this is kind of where, for those of you who deal with the IRBs, this is where the, the whole notion of um, special protections for people with, uh, with psychiatric illness comes from. Um, psychosurgery, so this is um, sort of responding to the lobotomies and sort of the uh, um, the history uh, of that in American medicine, um, de definition of death. So, you know, how do we, 
uh, how do we define death as something that um, is just the non-functioning of the brain or uh, the non-functioning of the heart or the lungs, right? And so uh, this is really important for transplantation. Um, and then, um, and then, kind of in the in the '90s, there's kind of this swing back from um, sort of protecting certain vulnerable vulnerable populations to a worry that maybe we had overprotected by. Um, you know, if you exclude people with schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease from research, turns out there's less research done on those diseases and people with those diseases don't benefit from research. So trying to find a, a, a way to, to better assess decision-making capacity and who can participate in research and who, um, and who uh, should, should be uh, more protected. Um, so, um, so if you talk to bioethicists, there's a, um, especially in the early 2000s, they would say there's all, uh, all this concern about, uh, the, the, about neuroethics and giving this, uh, coining this new term is a kind of exceptionalism in that you know, the same kinds of issues that show up with neuroscience research are the same kinds of issues that we always sort of dealt with. Um, it's just coming from fancier technology and um, and, um, and, you know, I think there, there's certainly some, and you, you also sort of saw this with uh, genetics and, the, um, uh, and deciphering the genetic code. But I do think that there are some differences um, with neuroscience, and, and some of these you know much better than I do, um, uh, that, that I'm not sure create brand new problems, but I think they certainly do uh, challenge us by, um, bringing old problems uh, into new light and uh, making them uh, uh, more pressing. So, so the first is just, just this notion that, that um, neuroscience offers us a kind of direct data that um, in a way that uh, we may have not had before. So, you know, we, when we know things, we know things typically inferentially, right? So you know if the, if the person you're sitting next to is happy or sad or, or anxious by looking at their face, hearing the tone of their voice, seeing their, um, uh, their body movements. Um, and so you infer that, right? Um, you know whether or not someone has a, um, what, more or less what their memory is of a certain event by um, how they describe it or how they perform in describing it to someone else who sketches it or um, performing a, a task, task that, that shows that they have um, a, a memory, right? Um, um, since we're in Seattle, um, I thought I'd ask um, if anyone knows who the person in the top right hand corner is. Um, so the one in the, the one in the left is. Yeah. How about the how about the one in the top right? Yes. And who is that? I think he like jumped out of a plane with five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So on so on uh, on on Thanksgiving um, nineteen seventy one he uh, took off from from Portland up flying up here to Seattle. Um, uh, had shown up at the airport, bought a ticket in cash, um, which you can't do anymore. Um, uh, got on the plane, um, showed someone that he had a bomb, um, said that he wanted $200,000 and some parachutes, uh, landed in C at SeaTac here. Um, they gave him those things. Um, uh, they flew back to Portland and he, uh, he opened the door and, and jumped out halfway between Seattle and Portland and they never found him. Um, uh, and there's, there's, uh, Periodically, maybe every couple of years, in the uh, in the press here, there are new theories. So, um, so, um, but but neuroscience offers us uh, a kind of direct data, right? So, um, you know, you can put someone in a scanner and uh, ask them uh, uh, while they while they say they're experiencing some emotional state, or you or while they while they are trying to recall some memory, right? And you can. Um, Get some 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 data, some correlation between uh, that mental state and uh, and that activity, right? And um, and we can uh, you know stimulate the brain in a way that's more direct than say um, you know telling someone to uh, to do to telling someone to do someone do something or go on a run or 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 something like that, right? There just there seems to be seems to be something different. Um, uh, when things are, are more direct. Um, just the fact that 
a lot of the data that we collect is just so much larger than it was before, right? So this is a, a picture of, a, of the original, uh, one of the original CAT scans up, up there in the left, and then, um, and then pictures of CAT scans used to uh, combine structure and, uh, and function in someone who's having a stroke now. And just the amount of data that, are, that um, goes into one versus the other uh, is just dramatic. Um, and on the right are um, EEGs. So you know, we had paper EEGs before, and now um, uh, you know, you do um, EEG recording over 24 hours to assess for some, whether someone has seizures, and, um, and that, you know, a day's recording is, is 10 gigs, so, um, so just a, a lot of data. Um, and then computational power, again, something you know much more about than I do. This, um, this is my uh, uh, first computer, which was uh, referred to as a, a lunchbox, it had a it had a whopping 12 um, megahertz processor and um, and a, a 40 megabyte hard drive, which was just amazing. And uh, uh, it cost me a, a mere two thousand dollars back in 1990. Um, so um, I think I think those sort of three features of sort of the emergence of neuroscience are, are important and and do sort of push us um, to sort of think about um, think about issues that we've already th thought about before, but um, but raises new questions. So so one is sort of disorders of consciousness. So um, you know persistent vegetative state uh, uh, and the uh, and the like have been um, issues that that in medicine um, going back into the 70s. Um, so this is Karen Ann Quinlan, who the sort of famous case of a, of a woman who entered a persistent vegetative state, and her parent uh, was on a ventilator, and her parents wanted to take uh, the ventilator off and let her die. And um, and the hospital, this was in the mid '70s in New Jersey, said, "You can't do that; she'll die. Um, um, you'd be killing her." Um, and then uh, they took uh, the family took them to court, and then the, the state said. As the state of New Jersey, it's our responsibility to protect people from um, from being removed from from uh, uh, from ventilators and such. And so they went all the way up to the to the Supreme Court, and this sort of started um, uh, a precedent uh, that uh, is just important that we now sort of take for granted that um, we can refuse medical care um, even if it's uh, life sustaining, um, and that. Um, and that we can have surrogates who speak on our behalf, um, and so that those those sorts of things have just become um, sort of standard fare in medicine and bioethics. Um, but uh, but neuroscience allows us to um, to do things like. Um, put someone who everyone has felt is in a persistent vegetative state um, in, an, in a, a scanner, uh, ask them to, to imagine playing tennis or walking around their room, and then find that they activate the same brain, brain regions as a control, which um, I think shocked a lot of people in, in neurology, right? And so um, you combine that sort of work with um, some work in using deep brain stimulators in, in individuals with um, profound disorders of consciousness and find that uh, sometimes uh, it dramatically improves their uh, ability to, to function. And when you combine those two things, uh, it's not surprising that there's, um, that raises a whole, whole set of new issues. Um, one of which is, you know, are we, um, are we violating the human rights of this huge group of people? There's more than 100,000 people who um, sort of are diagnosed with uh, in being vegetative every year and put in nursing homes, and maybe we're not diagnosing them right, and maybe we're not treating them right. Um, but also, if you can treat people and, and, um, and take them from uh, pretty much uh, almost never conscious to slightly more conscious, are you doing them a service or a disservice? I mean, they're um, hard questions that before, before this technology, we really weren't asking. Um, enhancement has been, a, has been a, an issue in bioethics, uh, again, back into the 70s. Kind of one of the, uh, the main debates was uh, over, and over uh, using human growth hormone, hormone in, in, uh, in children who uh, were of short stature, right, to get them up to a, 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 a quote unquote normal height um, because of the advantage, social advantages that would come with that. Um, 
uh, and that kind of debate has sort of morphed into um, debates about using enhancements in sports or um, cognitive enhancements, right? Ritalin or Adderall for for um, uh, for academics or work. Um, and and so if you you then sort of bring in neuroscience. Um, the kinds of devices that are now available or are likely to become available raise a lot of these uh, similar questions. So on the left here is a cochlear implant. Um, uh, and so what if you could use a cochlear implant to improve someone's hearing, not just kind of back to sort of um, average human hearing, but better than any human can hear, right? Is that something that we should do should or not? Um, there was a, there's a researcher in Canada who who surveyed people who were getting or who had cochlear Im implants and asked them this question and I think almost half of them said that they would definitely want that. So is that something you would deny people or uh, or not? Um, and you know other technologies are going to um, uh, raise sort of similar questions. Um, privacy and confidentiality is a big um, and long-standing uh, issue in, in medicine, right? Um, one, um, one that we, we think of as uh, rather settled, right? So um, we now have regulations that uh, protect medical information and genetic information. Um, and there are some exceptions, right? If, if um, this is the Tarasov case, so um, you, know, you, you can't, um, confidentiality isn't inviolable, you can break confidentiality if, if you have to protect someone uh, of the public from a known danger. Um, but different neuroscience technologies now allow us to, to, um, to think about privacy in a different way. So there's a, a group here um, who's been doing work with uh, uh, P300 signals and seeing whether or not you can uh, uh, glean um, glean information from someone without them revealing it. So, you know, can you uh, figure out what color, what, some, what someone's favorite color is, or can you figure out what their uh, PIN number is? Um, uh, and you can imagine that, um, and they've um, had a um, disturbing amount of success at this. Um, and you can imagine that if you're able to do this, then, um, you know, what are the other things that you could uh, determine, right? Um, someone's political preferences, their um, sexual preferences, um, um, a whole host of things. Um, uh, so, you know, I think since the 50s and 60s, we've recognized that advertising is a very powerful thing. Um, so powerful that we, you know, put, put warnings uh, um, on advertisements below pictures of beautiful people. We prohibit um, subliminal advertising in TV and movies. Um, we sort of balance out advertising um, with the, you know, ask your doctor requirement from the FDA um, so that, uh, so that uh, individuals have to go and, um, and get uh, more information uh, uh, and not just rely on the advertisement. Um, uh, but now there's um, sort of this, this thing called, that has been termed neuromarketing, right? Which is using neuroscience to, to make advertising more powerful. Um, and, uh, and it's sort of hard to separate some, since a lot of this is proprietary, it's sometimes hard to separate the, um, the hype from the, um, what's, uh, what's real. Um, but the, there is sort of this, this well-described um, a case from this company called Neurofocus, which, which got a lot of press about 10 years ago, um, and then was bought up by Nielsen, the, the ratings company, um, um, around uh, them helping out the uh, Frito-Lay around uh, a campaign for Cheetos. So, um, so I guess Fritos was concerned, or Frito-Lay was concerned that, um, uh, that, that, the, uh, that Cheetos were, were kind of messy, and they were afraid that, that this might be um, uh, in, impairing their sales, um, and so um, and so they hired an advertising company uh, <coughs> and created this um, uh, and and Neurofocus and created this ad, which is kind of fun to to watch if you have a chance, where um, where these two women are in a in a laundromat and um, and one woman is is sort of um, 
really mean to the other, and uh, and that uh, and that woman then uh, turns the mean one sort of turn, turns away, and the other the other woman takes her Cheetos and opens up the other woman's dryer and puts them in and closes it and um, and walks away, and. Um, uh, and the, they did the fo this, these focus groups, and the focus group said I, they hated the commercial. And, um, uh, and, uh, and then NeuroFocus, I guess, did um, so, uh, use DEG to show that, in fact, actually, uh, most of them liked the commercial. They were just sort of ashamed to, um, to say so. And so uh, then Cheetos, um, and you may be familiar with this, sort of went on this, uh, this campaign uh, that this sort of pushes on the notion of, of sort of um, rebelliousness um, and so thinking that actually um, what people who, uh, who eat Cheetos, uh, they, they, don't, they don't worry so much about the messiness. It's a way of sort of um, flouting social norms. So, um, so again, I don't know how I don't know how true that is, but um, just a couple just a couple more things. So, um, so one is is um, is sort of the importance of the doctor patient relationship, and this this ends up being sort of a foundation of of medical ethics. Um, you know, uh, even if you sort of put aside the sort of um, uh, overly simplistic uh, paternalistic pictures of uh, of medicine, um, but. Um, but you know, when we think about uh, uh, medicine in the in the area of neural devices, um, it's it's going to put pressure on on that relationship, right? So, so we've done we've done work with uh, a group in Boston who has implanted people with deep brain stimulators for depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, turns out, that, at least with depression, these devices haven't um, haven't been terribly successful. But but one of the theories about that is that um, you really need um, so these devices kind of sort of provide a constant set of or, um, of stimulation, and what you really need is a, a device that sort of adjusts its stimulation based on what's happening in the brain. Um, and so the next generation of devices are um, to have what are called closed loop devices. Um, and so, you know, if you if you think that that if that is the case, right, that you have these closed loop devices that um, involve some sort of machine learning, right, so that um, you you learn to detect what the what the biomarker of depression is, and then you provide stimulation for that, and then the the uh, biomarker changes a little bit, and you provide stimulation for that, um, and so you sort of need to sort of set. Um, Set this up, uh, set the algorithms up in advance, um, and then you sort of set, are likely going to just sort of set them in motion. And when you do that, you you sort of take the physician sort of out outside of the um, outside of the decision making process on an ongoing basis, um, which may be good, may be bad. I don't know, but uh, but then it does sort of change the way in which you're, the patient is interacting with the physician and the. This notion of the device as as its sort of own entity that we need to sort of think about about do we uh, is it does it make sense to say we trust a device um, in the way we sort of trust the physician to um, to make to make the, the the right choices if that's the right word um, uh, and then uh, just a couple more so. Um, the use of, of neuroscience um, in the law is is gaining a lot of interest too in the last decade or so. Um, whether sort of finding biomarkers of um, psychopathy, um, or um, or thinking about interventions that um, that might be clinically useful, but also have societal impacts. So, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's, for instance, which is a is now a a very common late stage treatment. Um, it, it uh, can affect um, impulsivity and uh, sometimes reduce uh, impulsivity, sometimes um, uh, uh, increase it. And so, um, so there's this paper about uh, the effect of DBS on um, uh, Parkinson's patients who, ha who have pedophilia, right? So you can imagine that um, that if DBS could reduce pedophilia um, in a particular individual, you can imagine a judge um, taking that information into account, whether the person has DBS or doesn't, or whether or not they're promising to undergo it or not. Um, you can imagine it being 
kind of coercive, right? If you're just about to stand trial and you're thinking, um, can I reduce my sentence by, by getting DBS? Do you, um, you know, we were talking about sort of vulnerable populations. So prisoners are a vulnerable population. And so, um, you know, these are, um, these are issues that are gonna have to be concerned, uh, thought about. Um, the use of dual technology, right? So a lot of the, a lot of the technologies uh, being developed either um, with um, DARPA funding or, or other military funding um, have military uses, but they also potentially have um, a non-military uses and sort of figuring out how we want to, um, to balance that is worth thinking about. Uh, and then the last thing I just wanted to, to point out is um, uh, sort of work, the, the way technology is, is going to increasingly change the workplace, right? So, um, you know, we've, we've used personality uh, tests for a long time to, to assess uh, whether or not people are right for their job. Um, um, and, um, you know, people, or companies have used uh, video to, to surveil their workers and or, you know, now sort of um, keystroke monitoring, right, to, to, to figure out certain things about their workers. But, um, but there's, um, but there are, you know, neuroscience can be used uh, to do this as well. So there was this article um, a couple months ago about a Chinese company that was um, hooking its workers up to EEG um, to measure their level of um, attention and concentration. Um, I don't know if it's actually, uh, would actually provide any kind of data. It's, uh, it would seem to be, me to be um, unlikely to do so. Um, but I, you know, I think there, there certainly is um, uh, an openness to, to, using, uh, to using neuroscience in this way. Um, and thinking about, thinking about uh, workers' rights, um, uh, is something we probably ought to do. Um, so, um, so what I thought I'd do now is I'm gonna, uh, I've got these cases. Um, there are three of them. I thought we could uh, uh, break apart into how many, I don't know how many groups you would recommend us doing um, and how we do that. <laughs> um, We can do that, and then we'll we'll talk for you know you can talk in those groups for um, you know ten minutes or so, and then we'll just kind of um, we'll come back to the group and then uh, and then do it again a couple times. Um, these cases are uh, I should say are um, were used at a um, at a um, kind of consensus conference on uh, on neurotechnology uh, and ethics um, um, at Columbia uh, last year, and. Um, and served as the basis of a, of a paper in, in Nature. Um, so you can go back and, and look at that um, after. Um, but they, um, they tend to be geared more toward uh, implantable neural devices, um, but, I, but I think raise some kind of broader issues here. So, um, so why don't I, or why don't we try to break up into, into groups of roughly six, and then, um, and then I can come by and give you guys some cases. So it's, uh, let's all just kind of up to speed here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you're all here. Find five people. And so we, we have space outside. Some people also, some of you will have to go outside. People who are closer to the center, stay here. Folks in the back, find other people. Go out and go or stay where you are. So can I give you, there's a couple, I'll, if I have more, I'll give you guys more. Yep. Uh, oh, thanks. Yeah. 
I'm just gonna, I'm gonna step by you here. Thank you. You have a small group? More people, maybe. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll see if I can find anybody. What do you think are the key concerns? What are the things that um, that worried you the most about uh, the Jane case? It's already done all the time at the clinics every day. Thousands of hours of video EEG are recorded with people at ECOG strips, um, and they're in the hospital observation with procedures. And at this point, I know that the epileptologist would love to have a facial monitoring system that accurately identified what was going on in the person's brain, if not head, mm -hmm. with these seizure events recorded. So it feels to me like the real issue here is the extent to which these data become publicly available and is, you know, is it within any rational ethical, you know, process to choose to do this work at all? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. We had an interesting segue with the discussion about um, the disparity between the financial situation of the participant and the amount of money the participant would be offered uh, for a particular study. And mm -hmm. there, were, there were voices saying that um, it, it actually would be unethical because of that disparity, because you know, the mm -hmm. amount of money would be too high considering the, uh, the wealth, income, and the particular situation of participants. Mm -hmm. So you're worried about um, co coercion within, within, she couldn't say no. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I mean, this is an interesting question, right? I mean, whether or not, uh, right, you can't sell your organs, um, but there seems to be, uh, but I'm, I mean, do you think that, uh, that the, the analogy holds to your um, neural data or not? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that that is the opposite. So coerced into selling it because she has no other options, right? Like maybe if she wasn't, if her home wasn't going to be foreclosed, then she would think very differently, but now she's vulnerable because she's in financial distress. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But thanks, that makes sense. Go ahead. through the research team that there was a sort of that it was their expertise that was going to like make that link and also they didn't know Jane in the first place so as a sort of thought experiment if there was someone from the marketing team who was just knocking on doors in the epilepsy ward and being like hey do you want to be part of this study that's quite a different situation than reaching out to the experts at a particular university who when they collaborate with a commercial company, give that commercial company more sort of credibility than if the, if the company was just doing it on their own. Hmm. And so there was a sort of ethical consideration about not passing on a message for a study that we kind of agreed was probably not gonna work and be of particular use or value beyond a gimmick for the commercial hmm. company. Hmm. That's interesting.
Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, um, you know, the, the uh, in, in, right, there, there's, there's sort of the, the primary question about whether or not you should be able to sell your data, but there's also, um, uh, there's also this question of, of vulnerability. So you, you could um, you could imagine that um, there is a gaming company that uh, develops a device that uh, that uh, does effectively measure some um, some neural signals and um, develops a really expensive gaming uh, gaming device um, such that um, there are a lot of uh, people who would like to use that but can't afford to use it, but then uh, might trade the ability to have that um, uh, by giving their, their data to the, to the gaming company, right? Um, and, um, and so is that, is that this, a similar sort of vulnerability concern? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can be dangerous in any way, but if we are absolutely sure that it is not, that's the key. What if it's not dangerous? What if it's just that I can figure out what products to to push to you in the right, in so the game? What's that? Isn't this what happens all the time? Yeah. Well, we have it free, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the question. Is this, is this data any different than the data that we give all the time when we go shopping on Amazon or, right? What do you think, do you think this data is any different or is it? I think it's necessarily categorically different, but because there are researchers and, and universities and hospitals involved, the standards, the ethical standards, uh, uh, probably will be higher. But mm -hmm. Obviously, ethics should be seen to some definition should be the universal law, mm -hmm. uh, which should apply everyone who are the same way. But in, mm -hmm. in practice, I think the ethical standards of figuring out knowledge uh, mm -hmm. or using data are higher in hospitals and universities than they are in the industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is part of the concern there that that there might be. Uh, you might discover things in that data that that are medically um, important, or or you might act on you might you might um, be fed information back that you might act on, thinking that right. So there are um, there are certain um, neural patterns that that people think might be associated with early Alzheimer's disease, right? Or schizophrenia or something, right? And so if I have one of these commercial devices and at some point, right, not now, but and those things would have to be truly correlated. Um, the company now has this data about that, that seems to suggest that um, that you have this condition or, or they have a high probability of this condition. What is the, what is the? There could be much simpler examples of that that yeah. are like within the realm right now, like a company collects uh, uh, information about what websites you visit, yes? Mm -hmm. And let's say um, your, your sexual preference uh, is a secret mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and they can figure out what this, uh, your mm -hmm. sexual orientation based on what websites you visit. Mm -hmm. And that information uh, could in certain context be uh, even inadvertently uh, used in a way that would harm you because of mm -hmm. how you choose to, to keep that information. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is probably happening every day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and the question is whether that, what we need to do about this. And I don't know the answer to it. But mm -hmm. it's, it, we don't need to even go into the like sci fi of, of mind reading using pulse of magnetism. Instead. Yeah, yeah. I wonder the distinction between these two kind of dichotomies of whether you're getting data from social media or from uh, you know, uh, consumers and uh, commercial uh, practices or things like that versus medical data is uh, the way that we treat uh, healthcare you know, you know, in this country where we treat healthcare as an overright and necessarily a privilege. And healthcare providers are not only um, sometimes you know, obligated to provide care or at least um, you know, offer care. 
uh, mm -hmm. to patients. And so getting data from uh, a medical uh, intervention uh, or some part of your, 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 your medical records is treated very differently from, even if it is similar records that are gathered from Facebook or from Google or from your um, mm -hmm. social media or other search patterns. You treat those things very differently, and part of it's because of the um, vulnerability you have as a, uh, a patient or someone in that healthcare realm versus somebody who's just, um, you know, actively choosing to participate in Facebook, uh, where we don't choose or we don't treat the choice to participate in healthcare um, the same way. Mm -hmm. So I actually think that I have the opposite impression. I think uh, America specifically treats healthcare like a privilege and not a right because we don't guarantee universal health care coverage for people. And so this is an ethical problem that comes up when we just do like basic MRI. Like We'll have a, part a participant that comes in and has a blob on their brain. And we send it off to a doctor who takes a look at it. And if it is something that is concerning that will probably you know, cause them trouble later on, we tell them. But I think there's not enough weighting of how much that distress can affect a person, especially if they are in dire straits and might not be able to afford, you know, going to the doctor to get checked up or additional tests and things like that. And I think that's something that would be also a concern if we're talking about, you know, future mind reading of looking for patterns of pre-schizophrenia or Alzheimer's or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, how much distress it can cause a person too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of what to do with sort of incidental findings is a, um, was a was a big issue in um, in the beginning of uh, the field of neuroethics, um, and I think kind of where that where that uh, issue and dilemma has is going is sort of um, developing um, these sort of maybe neurobehavioral um, incidental findings, right? So if um, uh, if we if we can uh, infer that um, you know that you have uh, uh, early indications of Alzheimer's disease or something else or um, or just um, or just something about your uh, 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 personality right that that might point uh, in um, in some pathological direction um, um, Okay, so let's let's go. Let's um, kind of quickly move on to the second second case. Any thoughts on on Sanjay? How did Sanjay change his name to Josh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, there was there was yeah. There were a couple of pronouns I, I I forgot to fix and a couple names, so I apologize. all the students' hands as they leave. He hasn't practiced the handshaking task in the lab as much as he would like. So he doesn't feel 100% confident about shaking hands and then decides to do it. So mm -hmm. To me, it is his fault not for using it in the first place for shaking hands when he wasn't confident in it. I wish this paragraph had a little bit more on whether or not the engineers said he was good to go on shaking his hand and mm -hmm. then it didn't work because then I would say it's definitely their fault and it was a malfunction, but the information isn't there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, funny how that's not in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is obviously a very uh, uh, timely 
question because the people at Tesla are dealing with this right now. Mm -hmm. When their cars crash and it kills somebody, are the engineers responsible for that or some AI person, uh, you know, con construct that can't hold in a prison responsible for that? Um, so that's obviously something that's very, very proving at the moment. But even if you could, let's say this uh, person has shaken uh, the hands of an engineer 10,000 times and every time went perfectly smoothly, um, what does that mean for this person who now shook a hand of somebody who he potentially had some bad outcome with? Does it mean that um, I've done this 10,000 times and this is uh, invaluable and therefore it's not the engineer's fault? Does that prove that you know, you've done it 10,000 times and the only time you crush somebody's hand is when it was somebody who uh, were adversarial with and therefore it's clearly your fault? Um, it, it, uh, it, there's a lot of questions there that are mm -hmm. um, not answerable, I don't think, at the moment. But it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yep. It seems like there might be some kind of a problem just sending somebody home with a bone crushing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like maybe until you're really confident this works, turn the force down a little bit. Huh? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I mean, I guess one of the issues. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the NPA. All right. Anyone else on this one before we move on to the last one, real quick? All right. So, what about Tabitha? Was it wasn't bone crushing? Yeah. Um, we've all sort of made typos or made autocorrect mistakes and kind of add these things together. Mm -hmm. And I, my opinion was that this was a, a situation where she, it's a good piece of feedback to send back to the to the developers to be mm -hmm. like maybe there should be some sort of safe mode because when I talk to all my friends about my ex boyfriend and about what a jerk he is, and I need to be able to like put in some little bit of protection to watch my language mm -hmm. around him. Mm -hmm. But I, I, my personal opinion was that it, it wasn't something that kind of made it super unethical for the um, researchers to build this device in the first place. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the Freudian slip was not as bad as the Freudian grip. Yep, there you go. There you go, nice. nice. Well, well done, <laughs> well done. Sure, but if you have like intense social anxiety and whatever else, this could have been way more 
like that, even if you're not bringing someone else's bones. But I think this sort of exists in, in both of these two scenarios. Like, what was the harm? Right. Yeah. Uh, I was more concerned with the fact that the that the algorithm has access to all this rich data and AI, a lot of AI have a propensity to be incredibly racist and prejudiced mm -hmm. that um, we're almost lucky that she only called him a jerk and that's something that she really didn't need to. Yeah, it's a good. Those thoughts are her brain. She let's say she was racist with AI just to avoid that Is that her fault or the AI? Yeah, I mean, I, we, you know, the, the the case could have been um, right. We we could certainly substitute in something that's that's more damaging than than uh, than uh, offending uh, an ex-boyfriend. Um, um. So we, we had that discussion, but are we. I don't think it's clear from this whether there are whether there are sort of certain words and phrases that that are already blocked. And I guess I was coming at it from a kind of reasonably benevolent sort of um, view for the developers and it, if she's had lots of conversations where she calls Jerry a jerk to her friends in private or you know whatever other situations mm -hmm. it seems like a pretty like expected feature of the machine learning model like even if you did have great training data and you understood it like it seems like that is exactly what the machine learning is supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So it's working as designed. Mm -hmm. And I think, I completely agree though, I think it's a really important point about kind of communicating in both directions about like, here's the, here's the thing, it will learn and it won't know your social context when, when it's coming up with responses. And then getting feedback about like, how would you like to grade it mm -hmm. based on who's going to have to <laughs> so they could have just switched hands for this country. Okay. Uh, you know, other hands, left hands. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, Sunday, but. <laughs> But, but he's a pretty much of a traditionalist, right? I mean, you know, he's, he wants to shake, shake, shake with his dominant hand. And, uh. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for doing this. This was, this was fun. Thank you.